be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as we begin, until we conclude and forever. Amen. O Lord God, in your plan of salvation, you will that your church would suffer and endure hardship for proclaiming the truth. In every age you provide the blood of courageous martyrs who pour their lives into the life of the church. Now make us worthy to celebrate this memorial of the beheading of Saint John, your forerunner. To you we glorify, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. May we be worthy to praise, confess, and glorify the Father who created all things. The Son who planted a grapevine to fill up the cup of life. The Holy Spirit who sustains the suffering and the persecuted. To the good one our due glory and honor now and forever. Amen. O Lord God, you are blessed by the memory of those who love you and who suffer for that love. Today we honor the feast of your chosen martyr, Saint John, the forerunner on this day of his beheading, whose intercession we now turn to. May those who witness to your holy name without fear now come to give courage to your church wherever she is persecuted for your name's sake. It is by the blood of martyrs that the parched earth of faithfulness is watered. The blood of martyrs became the living stream that made all things prosper and grow. The blood of martyrs became the lamp that dispelled the darkness and filled the entire house with light. When taken before judges and magistrates, the martyrs fulfilled the Lord's words. When questioned before courts and tribunals, the Holy Spirit answered for them. They left their accusers amazed and speechless. No disciple is greater than his master, so the martyr shared in the cross of Christ, eating the Lord's dying and drinking his rising. Today the church recalls their memory to their children as a witness of faith and a lesson of patient endurance. Blessed is God who remains with his church. To him be glory forever.
God, as you accepted the blood of martyrs who witnessed to the faith, accept the prayers and offerings of your church and keep her ever faithful. Strengthen her sails against the storms of persecution. Encourage her children against the waves of hopelessness and despair. Confirm and direct her leaders, for she looks to your saving cross as to her master. O strength of the persecuted, guide your church through the storm to a safe harbor of your kingdom. And there with all your saints and martyrs, we shall glorify you now and forever. Amen. Allah Kodishat Hayal Tono Kodishat Lomaho Yahuto Shout with joy from the mountain, Sunday is a fee so great. Offer praise to the Lord God, and with angels celebrate. Hebrews. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish, and your children forever. Brothers and sisters, what more shall I say? I have not time to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, did what was righteous, obtained promises. They clothed the mouths of lions, put out raging fires, escaped the devouring sword. Out of weakness they were made powerful, became strong in battle, and turned back foreign invaders. Women received back their dead through resurrection. Some were tortured and would not accept deliverance in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others endured mockery, scourging, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, sawed in two, put death at sword's point. They went about in skins of sheep or goats, needy, afflicted, tormented. 
The world was not worthy of them. They wandered about in deserts and on mountains, in caves and in crevices in the earth. Yet, all these, though approved because of their faith, did not receive what had been promised. God had foreseen something better for us, so that without us, they should not be made perfect. Praise be to God always. Alleluia. Alleluia. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it and be glad. Alleluia. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Saviour, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark, who proclaim life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The evangelist Mark writes, and King Herod heard of these things, for his fame had become widespread, and men were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why mighty powers are at work in him. And others were saying, he is Elijah. And still others, he is a prophet, like any of the other prophets. But when Herod learned of it, he said, This is John whom I beheaded. He has been raised up. Herod was the one who had had John arrested and bound in prison on account of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip, whom he had married. And John had said to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Herodias then harbored a grudge against him and wished to kill him, but was unable to do so. But Herod feared John, knowing him to be a righteous and a holy man, and he kept him in custody. And when he heard him speak, he was much perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. Now, she had an opportunity one day when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers, his military officers, and the leading men of Galilee. And Herodias' own daughter came in and performed a dance that delighted Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask of me whatever you wish, and I shall grant it to you. And he even swore many oaths to her, that I shall grant you whatever you ask of me, even to half of my kingdom. And she went out, and she said to her mother, What shall I ask for? And she replied, 
the head of John the Baptist. So the girl hurried back to the king's presence and she made her request. I wish you to give me at once, on a platter, the head of John the Baptist. Now the king was deeply distressed, but because of his oaths and the guest, he did not wish to break his word to her. So he promptly dispatched an executioner with orders to bring back his head. And he went off and he beheaded him in prison. And he brought in the head upon a platter and he gave it to the girl. And the girl in turn gave it to her mother. And when his disciples had heard about this, they came and they took his body and they laid it in a tomb. This is the truth, peace be with you. And he knew that he was a righteous and holy man. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen. So what does it mean to be a martyr? We all have holy cards, we all have statues, we know those basic stories. Lions eat you up, you get burned, you get your head cut off, you get stabbed with a spear, whatever. These many, many different ways of inventiveness on how to kill someone. But it's not the killing which is martyrdom. The word martyr to this day is used all over the place. Muslims are martyrs, pagans are martyrs, and people are martyrs, people who are tree huggers are martyrs. But the word martyrdom is straight out of Christianity. And it is the influence behind all of these other uses of the term. The word martyr, of course, just means witness in Greek, to give testimony. And when we speak about the death of the martyrs, it's not because of their death. It's because they continue to witness up into and including being put to death for what they're giving witness to. And so this is why everyone in the church is meant to be martyr. Everyone in the church is meant to be giving testimony. Everyone is meant to give witness to what is true of God's revelation. So that's one thing this day. The other thing is, of course, this story is set in a totally dysfunctional modern family. Herod, Herodias, the daughter, who we don't know from the scriptures, they don't give a name of the girl, but we know from the Jewish uh, contemporary historian Josephus, he says that the girl's name was Salome, because of course this story is known. John the Baptist is spoken of in the secular historical book of Josephus. And so we know from there that her name is Salome. And apparently she goes on to be a very fitting daughter of her mother and apparently was quite a humdinger later on herself in her own kind of tyranny and iniquity. But when we witness to the faith, it's not just a theolo theological abstract thing. It's not about just simply what is revelation as a doctrinal aspect. But to give testimony is also to give testimony about how Catholics behave. In other words, on morality and virtue. And so we have the window in the back of St. Maria Goretti, because when the church was being built, it was in those years that Maria Goretti was canonized. And so they took opportunity to honor this 16-year-old girl, or this 14-year-old girl, who was being canonized at that time. And Maria Goretti was canonized as a martyr because she died for the virtue of purity. When she was assaulted by the, the older boy who simply was burning with lust and wanted her 
and had seen her, the families lived in with proximity to each other. And he had no control over his passions and his lust, and so the lust eventually controlled him. So at the age of 19 or so, when she had come back off the farm, and she's back at the farmhouse, and he realizes it's the only two of us at the house, he tries to rape her. And her response to him all the time is, this is a sin, this is evil, this is a sin, we can't do this. And she resists him to the point where he becomes so enraged by his lust that he simply stabs her to death in the farmhouse. And so when she's canonized, she's canonized as a martyr. There's nothing theological in her death. But she dies defending chastity, defending purity, defending the integrity of her own personal body, her life. And St. John the Baptist also is not dying because of an article of the faith. John the Baptist is dying because of morality. He is in prison because of the integrity of marriage. He is imprisoned because of Herodias. We're told in this situation, and first I suppose we should talk about the context of this episode. The gospel began by saying, when Herod heard of these things. So what are these things? Earlier in this text, you have the beginning of the proclamation of the kingdom. The apostles have been sent out, they go out, they prepare the places to receive our Lord, and in that preparation also they anoint the sick, and the sick are being healed, and miracles are being worked. And that is what is reported back and is heard by Herod. And that's when he starts wringing his hands and he says, oh, 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 this is, this is John come back from the dead, I know it, I know it. This man is haunted. He is plunged in his lust. That's why I say this is a story of a modern family. Herod is a modern man. He kind of likes nice, he kind of likes right things to do, but he doesn't do them. He knows John is a righteous man and a holy man, and he respects that, and he's intrigued when he listens to him teaching, but he also throws him in prison because of his wife. And so he doesn't know what to do. And then all of a sudden, when the kingdom is being proclaimed and the, and the apostles are going out to prepare the path of our Lord, he's like, oh no, oh no, this man, referring to our Lord, this is John come back from the dead. That's the context in which this story is then told by St. Mark. So now I will tell you about what Herod did to John. And when this episode finishes in today's gospel, and our Lord is told about it, the apostles come and they tell him about what had happened to John being decapitated. Our Lord says, well, go away from here. Because he can see that they are highly, they're, they're overwhelmed by this. This is their first time they see, this is not just about religion, this is a question that may bring about your death. And of course, we all know that ultimately all of the apostles do give their lives for the gospel. But at this point in the beginning of the ministry, in the beginning of these three years, they're quite stressed by this. And so our Lord says, okay, come away. And they go off into the wilderness. They go to the desert. They go to the place that's empty so they can be alone. But of course, when our Lord goes there, nobody ever lets our Lord go anywhere without following around. So everyone starts filing up there. And so then becomes the recounting of St. Mark's story of the multiplication of the loaves and fishes. So immediately after this episode of John having his head cut off, you have the miraculous feeding of the thousands with the bread and the fish. That's its context the nourishment that God gives of his abundance and the proclamation of the kingdom. And in the middle you have a dysfunctioning modern family. You have a woman, Herodias, who is completely out for herself. She's first married to one of the tetrarchs, now she finds a better deal with the brother, and apparently it looks like this was also actually her third marriage. The only two of them are talked about. And this is why John says to her, you cannot be married to your sister-in-law. 
the prophet denounces the king. We're not given the episode, but we're told that he had told the king in no uncertain terms, you cannot be having living with your sister-in-law. Now, because Herodias had heard this, and her feminine sense of her personhood was highly, she became highly indignant. And we're told in no uncertain terms in this text that she has a grudge. She hates this man for having told her that what she's doing is wrong. John is just hand-wringing and perplexed because deep down he knows it's not right. But it works politically, and after all, she's pretty, and so, and so, and so, and so. And in the modern world, we make excuses for all of our sins of sensuality. Everything has an excuse. All that part of the apostolic doctrine for so many people apparently has just disappeared. The notion of chastity, the notion of virtue, the notion of the proper respect and awe paid to sexuality, all of that just has gone out the window. Well, it hasn't gone out the window 50 years ago. We see it in this family. And of course, when, when the young woman comes in to dance at this birthday party, Salome, she's her daughter's, she's her mother's daughter. So it already seems inappropriate that this is the stepdaughter of the king and also his niece. Remember, this is a previous marriage. So it seems highly inappropriate in the first place is why is what essentially we call a princess, why is she just entertaining? For most of the history of the world, and quite easy to see these days, actors and actresses were always considered to be public sinners. The things you do on stage to make people laugh or like you are not always the best things. So all you have to do is think about even the vocabulary used in a modern film. None of this is appropriate. And you say, well, they're just acting. Yes, but what they're acting is lascivious and unacceptable. And therefore, the notion of an actor, if you died in the early centuries of the church and you were an actor, you worked in the theater, you weren't even buried. You were not given a Christian burial because you were considered a public sinner. And so when you died working in the theater, you were still a public sinner at the moment that you died. You died separated from God. So there's already an inappropriateness of Salome to be up there dancing around in front of, in front of generals and politicians. But as she does, of course, all these men are like, well, hubba hubba, this is great. She's really good. Totally modern story. A version of one of these decadent diner places put up, one of these restaurants. We go there to stare at girls. It's like, this is so repulsive. And so Herod is part of the whole mood of this party. And he says, look, anything you ask me, I'll give you. And then he starts swearing oaths. I swear to God that I'll give you anything that you ask me, including up to half of my kingdom. Now, when we first look at that, that just looks like generosity. But it is also a proposition to this young woman, this teenager. Half of my kingdom, it is a veiled way of saying, I will make you my queen. You get rid of your mother. After all, we already went to the second and third one. Why don't we bring in this one? She's much more beautiful. She's younger. In any case, you get more mileage out of her, right? This is the way the world thinks. So when he promises even half of the kingdom, he's already making even an incestuous proposition to his niece. See, this is a very modern family. It's repulsive. And of course, she goes running off. We're told she goes away quickly. She goes to her mom. Gosh, think of it. What should I ask for from Uncle Herod? Give me the head of the man who is in the dungeon. Because Herodias the whole time has this man locked up in her palace. She wants him dead. So this becomes the perfect opportunity. Tell him that you want the head of the creep in the basement that he should have killed a long time ago. So it's hard for us to imagine, what does a teenager think about, all right, give me this head, a human head? I'm not putting this on my dresser in my room. This is not happening. 
The whole notion is disgusting. So you'll notice there's a detail that is added between the time that she talks to Mumsy and goes back in to see the king. She says, I want the head of John the Baptist on a tray. Please don't bring it to me in a bag that's leaking blood every place. So she wants it on a platter. And then poor modern man Herod is wringing his hands and is now horrified. Oh, this is awful. I kind of like John. Herodias hates him. Oh, this is terrible. I've made O's. Everyone's watching me. Human respect doesn't allow me to do something other. So it's like, oh, oh, I don't really want to do this. Personally, I'm opposed to abortion. But you know we have to vote for it because this is what the population wants. And so wringing his hands is, I don't want John to die, but you, the execution, to come here, go down and take his head off. That is so modern. Well, I don't really agree with this, but I'm going to foster it, do it, or support it in some way. And you notice that when people act this way, the prophets of God die. This is what happens to truth in the world. If you heard the Husoyo that I sang for John, we speak about the martyrs pouring their lives into the life of the church. But it also in numerous places says that your church was given to proclaim to be the truth in the world. And for this reason she suffers. And so Herod sends off his executioners and they bring back the head of John the Baptist. This whole story is so recognizable for us from start to finish. Sadly. We know these people. We've all known a Herodias the gnashing teeth woman who is always trying to manipulate her way. We know the dishragged man who wrings his hands and thinks that he really should be choosing better things and doesn't choose them. And all of them plunged into pure sensuality and just whatever feels good, do it. We recognize all of these people. We've known them. They may not have been king, but we know these people. And so we celebrate on this day the beheading of John the Baptist. This is a very ancient, ancient festival in the church. It even predates the nativity, the birth of John the Baptist. So important this event was. So on this day, we ask that the Lord God clarify our minds. Remember, probably most of us are not going to have our heads chopped off before the end of our days, or making the end of our days. But it's possible, especially in the way the world goes today. But what we all have an obligation to do is to be a witness to our faith day in and day out. Everyone that we have contact with should know that we are a Catholic. Not because we say it, but because we live it. Because we give a testimony in our very existence of the transforming aspect of grace. That is the first thing to take from this festival. The second thing is, of course, that we have an illuminated faith so that we can see clearly and judge in this world, so that we are neither dishrag or teeth gnashing, manipulative grudge holder. That we see clearly in the light and choose what we need to do in our lives with the strength that God's grace gives to us, so that we also may be witnesses in our own days. And we ask on this day that St. John intercede for us, that he obtain for us this ability to be martyrs day in and day out, to give witness to the faith and to its truth. And even if it brings persecution and suffering, it always remains true. So let us curb our sensuality. Let us ask for that deeper faith and let us embrace the profound aspect of the transforming aspect of grace. And in that strength, may the prayers of St. John be a rampart to us always. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who please God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint John, the Forerunner. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. of St. Mark the Evangelist on page 835, 835. 
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord God, Almighty Father, you are true and holy love. May we be bound by your divine gift, love, and find joy in it all the days of our lives. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with a holy kiss, that through Jesus Christ our Lord we may be a radiant and blameless flock. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to God. before you and ask that you grant us in your mercy the riches of your grace and kindness. May your compassion and assistance sustain us all the days of our lives through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people. We glorify and honor you, your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. sent your only Son to save us, for we are weak and poor. When we had gone astray, he brought us back to your spiritual fold by his royal blood. Through your grace and the favor of your only Son, we implore you to accept this bloodless sacrifice from our sinful hands, and through it to forgive our sins. We glorify and honor you, your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship Him with humility. It is right and just. Truly glory, thanks, praise, and honor are yours, O God the Father, maker of all creation. With your only begotten Son and your living Holy Spirit, the angels, archangels, and all the heavenly hosts bless and praise you. They cry out and they proclaim.
Whenever you observe these holy commandments, you proclaim my death and resurrection until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We profess your resurrection. We await your second coming. We implore your mercy and compassion. We ask for the forgiveness of sins. May your mercy rest upon us. Lord Jesus Christ, we remember your plan of salvation for us. Your conception, birth, and baptism, your saving passion, and life-giving death. Your burial, your glorious resurrection, and ascension into heaven. Your sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and your royal second coming when you will judge all people, and reward them according to their deeds. Now we ask you, at that fearful hour, have compassion on us and have mercy on us in your kindness. For forgive all of our sins in your mercy. For this your church implores you and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us. As we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we profess our faith in you, and we ask you, have compassion on us, O God, have mercy on us and hear us. How awesome is this moment, O my beloved, for the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Anin monio, anin monio, anin monio, nite moro rojo kayo kodisho, unachenda lainu al korbono ono. May 
may these holy mysteries be for the forgiveness of sins, the pardon of faults, the honor, upbuilding and strengthening of your holy church, and the protection of her children from all sin. And may these holy mysteries allow us to stand with confidence before your awesome throne, that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, exalt your holy church established throughout the world. Protect her shepherds of the true faith in peace and security all the days of, the li of their lives. Especially Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bishara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops, pious priests, pure deacons, and all who serve your holy altar. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, all those who call upon your holy name. Bless those who are near and bring back those who are far. Visit the sick and strengthen the weak. Release captives and assist the oppressed. Bring back those who have strayed that they may live in your fear and reward those who have brought offerings to your holy church. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, our civil leaders and all the children of the holy church. Grant them your the security and peace and keep domestic and foreign conflicts far from them, so they may live in tranquility. Protect them by the sign of your living and victorious cross. Rescue the persecuted and the displaced of your flock, and be a refuge for strangers and a companion to travel. Grant your eternal reward to monks and those who live solitary lives, and to hermits who live on mountaintops and in the caves of the earth. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, upon this altar and upon your heavenly altar, the holy and ever Virgin Mary, Mother of God, the prophets, apostles, martyrs, confessors, and evangelists, John the Baptist, the forerunner, Stephen the archdeacon and first martyr, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Mary, and all the saints. May we join in their ranks and share in their joyful feast. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the faithful teachers who have gone to their rest in the true faith, especially Peter and Paul, Mark, Clement, Ignatius, Dionysus, Julius, and all those who endured suffering and persecution for the strengthening of your holy church. Remember also those who serve your holy altar and forgive their sin, that they may reach your joyful dwellings. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, all those who have left this world and have gone to you. Lead them to your joyful dwellings and blot out all their sins. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever.
martyrdom, you are the pleasing oblation who offered yourself for us. You are the forgiving sacrifice who offered yourself to your Father. You are the high priest who offered yourself as the Lamb. Through your mercy, may our prayer rise like incense, which we offer to your Father through you. To you be glory forever. O God the Father, you are merciful and compassionate. You have sanctified this divine service and have perfected it in your good pleasure by the grace of your only Son and by the descent of your Holy Spirit. Sanctify us now that we may be renewed as your spiritual children so that with pure hearts and enlightened souls we may call upon you, O glorious Father and lover of all people, praying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Deliver us, O Lord, from every temptation of soul and body, and crush our enemy, the evil one. Grant us your mercy through Christ Jesus our Lord, for you are blessed and glorified with him and with your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Bow your heads before the God of mercy before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake in it, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, look upon us, your inheritance, who bow before you, and guide our steps on your right path. Make us worthy to share in this sacrifice, and may it sanctify the souls and bodies of those who receive it, through Christ Jesus our Lord. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your Spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility, and ask Him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity.
again and again. We thank you, O oh Lord. We raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat, your living blood to drink, lover of all people. Have mercy on us. God the Father, how can we who are unworthy thank you for your grace? For you have given us this divine gift and have made us worthy to share in the body and blood of your only begotten Son who saved us. Through him and with him glory and honor are due to you and to your Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, you are worshipped and you are holy. Bless and forgive the priests who are the stewards of your people and of your holy church. Forgive the servers of your divine mysteries and all the faithful who have shared in this sacrifice. Care for orphans, help widows, assist the poor and the distressed, satisfy the hungry, and protect all who call upon your holy name in every place. May your name be glorified, with that of your Father and your Holy Spirit, who is good, life-giving, and consubstantial with you, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son 
and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.